weather whiplash with extremes in wet and dry cycles is becoming more of the norm. Unfortunately, we don't have enough wetlands. It's unlikely that we're ever going to be able to restore enough wetland habitat to fully support migratory bird populations. About 83% of native fish species in California are in some form of decline, and salmon exemplify those trends. If we want nature to thrive in the Great Central Valley, we're going to have to find ways to better manage our water. There is a particular smell with harvest, and you can go around the combine and you can smell rice, and it's a very unusual smell, but that always is a reminder of rice harvest. So we're harvesting Nashiki rice. It's not a big yielder, but it's the highest quality, so it's got the best flavor profile, and it's the most popular sushi rice out there. Rice is very unique. Agronomically, we can grow it every year. We've been doing it for 100 years. Water is where our uncertainty is, really. There's a large population here. There's demands from the environment, fish, waterfowl, and of course, agriculture. We can't survive long-term droughts in California. If there's climate change that does that, we're gonna have a real issue for us. Before European settlement, if you were to go back in a time machine, this entire area that we're sitting in right now would be a giant wetland, giant floodplain. In the late winter and early spring, when the snow would melt in the mountains, the water would come down into the rivers, they would spill over their banks and spread out over their historical floodplains. The valley was once like a vast mosaic of wetlands and floodplains grasslands, and then these tall gallery forests on either side of these major rivers. The land in the Central Valley is fertile, but it needs water to make it productive. To supply this water, two great dams were completed in 1944. People change the landscape. They use the landscape for food, for agriculture, for cities. We built dams on the river. We really controlled the rivers. Urbanization and agriculture and industry forced, you know, the draining of the swamp. And that's had a big change to the area and has resulted in a 95% loss of historic wetlands in the valley. The great network of canals and pumping stations provide water for millions of acres in the Great Valley. Near the state capital, Sacramento, we'll see how the farmers have made use of the lowlands bordering the Sacramento River. Rice became a fit in the Sacramento Valley because the pioneers, like my ancestors, could not get anything else to grow. Today, it's the best fit. And it's the climate, the heat, and most of all, water supply. And that's a great combination to make rice survive out here. Rice farming is really important to the community because as much as we talk about and think about the rice farmer and the farming families that grow rice, it doesn't stop there. The rice economy also employs people across the board. 500,000 acres is our magic number. And what's that mean to everybody? 25,000 jobs. That's gonna be produced by about 2,500 farming families. And there's five billion of value in that. Prior to flooding as a method of decomposing rice straw, most of the rice stubble was burned. Burning became an issue from an air quality standpoint, and so a ban was put on that practice, and there had to be an alternate way to decompose that straw. 
some innovative science was done and flooding for decomposition was brought forward as an option. And that had an unintended consequence of providing tremendous habitat for waterfowl. Rice fields probably represent the best surrogate habitat for the Central Valley wetlands that's left. For waterfowl specifically, rice fields provide 75% of their nutritional needs. When we talk about huge populations of birds coming in, seven to 10 million, they couldn't be supported in this landscape without rice. Guys, dowager. So this is a long-billed dowager. We just cut this bird in a noose mat. So what we're doing now is we're collected some blood, and that's how we're going to actually examine how these birds are doing physically. And that'll give us a sense of are they getting enough food? Are they stressed out? There's a lot of overlap in what waterfowl need and what shorebirds need. During the middle of the winter, they're all here and they'll often use some of the same fields. The difference is that waterfowl can use a lot deeper water, whereas shorebirds simply cannot use the deep water. And so by providing greater variation in depths across the landscape where we can provide for all of them, we can actually serve all of their needs. So what we were able to see in helping the bird population with providing habitat, we hope to be able to apply over to other species and help fish population as well. So right now, with how slow the water is normally flowing out, fish could easily just be hanging out right here and even swimming up into the pipe and hiding from us. Uh, so we lift the board for a minute, get a little extra flow going, encourage the fish to come out. It's not a very graceful process. You never know, right? We'll see what we get. Since the 1960s, they used to have adult spawning returns that would be over 100,000 spawning adults in the Sacramento River. They've declined to the point that a good year would be 10,000 fish, and we have years that are in the hundreds of fish. That's a run of salmon that's um, on the precipice of extinction. The one looked like a salmon to me, but we'll see. Yes, Chinook salmon, adipose fin is present. The shallow environment here warms up a little bit and it creates this massive food web. It's this very productive environment. Once you get out in the river, it, there's a lot less food. So it seems like they're happy to, to stay here and, and eat up. Can you work a bit closer to the shoreline? There's probably a bunch of little guys who like to hug that shoreline. Salmon bring these marine-derived nutrients up into the landscape. It's like a giant vitamin pill surging up into the landscape. And it feeds the terrestrial forest, it feeds the animals. 74 millimeters. The name of the game is to get as big as you can, as fast as you can. There's a gauntlet of predators from here all the way to San Francisco Bay, right? And even once you're out there, so what can you outrun? Because even small sunfish, their mouth doesn't open real big. So once you get to a certain size, they can't catch you anymore because that's what they're limited by, right? It's not like a human that can use a fork and a knife and cut you into pieces. They can only eat what, what can fit in their mouth. Salmon benefit from rice fields and from wetlands in general by rearing on them as juveniles. Going back in time, as they started to make their way out to the ocean, 
and they'd come onto the valley floor and they would rear in wetland habitat, basically gas up, and they'd eat these abundant zooplankton, and bugs that would grow on the wetland plants, and get big and fat and happy and get the energy they need to get to the ocean. So that's a large part of what we're doing. We're trying to measure what's the survival like in the field, and then once they leave and, and migrate to sea, do we see any sort of survival advantage? We're able to show that these fish grow exceptionally well in these habitats. They're not being fed by anything except the, the bugs that grow on these habitats. So they grow well, they survive well, they seem to survive better out to the ocean. That translates into a population effect. So we think if we do this the right way and we do enough of these fields like this, we can boost the population. The beauty of these rice fields, when they first start flooding up, they can provide great habitat for shorebirds. And then as they get deeper, they provide fantastic habitat for ducks and geese. And when they're in that deep state, they're growing food for fish. We're capturing shorebirds and tagging them, capturing waterfowl and tagging them, and also putting trackers in fish all with the same objective, trying to understand how they use the rice landscape and how they interact with the other habitats around them. And does that increase or decrease their survival? Largely we're seeing the ones that have access to the rice fields are doing better across the board. We have a great opportunity now to take that water management infrastructure and actually remanage it to both continue having a thriving agricultural economy, but also provide for fish and birds at the same time. If we weren't able to plant rice in the Sacramento Valley, there would be significant consequences. And not just consequences that we won't be able to export as much rice internationally, or we won't have as much rice here to provide domestically, but consequences as they relate to habitat. There's not enough wetland habitat available alone to support migratory bird populations. And they're dependent on rice to make up that deficit. Without water, the fields don't end up getting planted in the spring. And while that may seem somewhat trivial, the issue is that in the fall, you don't have the organic biomass. You may be able to flood up those fields, but without that food production, right, the value of those fields is significantly reduced. It's not so much one field here, one field there that makes the impact. It's the fact that we have hundreds of thousands of acres across the whole Sacramento Valley of growers that are willing to flood their fields. And it can make a really dramatic impact for water birds and wildlife. California rice is a great thing, and there's plenty of demand worldwide, and we're gonna take care of that. That satisfies that economic side, but you've got that other side that's unique to us in California, and it's that environmental benefit side. We have to find a way to reconcile the needs of people and fish and wildlife and this is an example of how we can do that. There's a strong collaboration and partnership that's already been developed, and that includes water agencies and state and federal agencies and the private landowners. So if we can just continue to work forward and preserve and enhance habitat for wildlife, I think that's a recipe for success. In the next generation, we would love to see thriving rice farms robust bird populations, and healthy fish populations. And with all of those three combined, that's really what a sustainable future looks like in the Sacramento Valley.